Hi, I'm Jordan Wilson. Today we're back to look at fixed income considerations when you start creating a target asset allocation. So our objectives today are just a quick recap on fixed income. Then we're going to look at target asset allocations by which phase of the life cycle you're in as well as some focal points that uh, are worth considering because they'll vary significantly from investor to investor. Fixed income, if we recall, basically bonds, debentures, notes, mortgages. It's a contractual arrangement that you enter into. You lend a business money. In return, they agree to make periodic interest payments to you and at some future date in all likelihood they agree to repay the principal. We saw that fixed income can be divided into secured versus unsecured. Secured is where there's a specific claim against an asset. Maybe that's a warehouse, maybe that's property. Basically if the company doesn't make the repayment, secured credit holders have a claim against a specific ans asset. Unsecured, they get in line with everyone else. Similar with senior versus junior. Seniors move to the front of the line if there is a business breakdown, insolvency, receivership. Juniors, again, have to queue up with everyone else. So that people can invest in fixed income, government bonds versus corporate. And on average, government bonds tend to be more secure because they're backed by the government versus an individual company. Now, as we saw with countries currently like Venezuela, it's not always true the government is a better bet than certain large companies. We talked about how debt can be defined by base. That's your usually your home currency. So if you live in the United States, the US dollar, you live in Canada, Canadian dollar, versus the local currency, that's the currency of the debt issue. So a Canadian company could issue debt in US dollars. Your base currency, Canadian, the local currency, the issue currency, US dollars. Debt's usually divided up as well by term to maturity long which could be over 10 years but probably closer out to 30 medium which would be the 1 to 10 maybe a little bit longer 1 to 15 and the short term which is almost cash equivalent under one year talked about as well how i would all allocate preferred shares as fixed income at least in my overall portfolio asset allocation. And that's because preferred shares are usually bought for their dividend income and they tend to behave quite similarly to fixed income. You buy fixed income in order to get interest income, some dividends. It's higher risk and higher return than cash or cash equivalents, but it's still much lower than the third asset class, equities. Useful for developing a consistent cash flow can be quite liquid especially shorter term debt so it's a good match for short term obligations or objectives you want to buy a house in six months maybe a short term bond will give you a slightly higher pay than a t-bill or a term deposit useful as well for diversification and in times that interest rates are falling, you can actually see nice capital gains from bonds. It's not just interest income. Of course, if interest rates rise, also subject to capital losses. And that's only, of course, if you sell them. If you hold to maturity and you bought at par, then you're going to get uh, just your principal back, no gains or losses. The accumulators, relatively young people starting their careers, 
maybe new entrepreneurs as well, maybe people who experienced a disruption in their work life, they tend to have little capital, little income, little free cash. For them, liquidity is quite important to meet their short-term needs. But because on average they tend to be young, any serious investing, they're probably going to likely have a longer term time horizon retirement. Maybe that's 40 years out. What kind of asset allocation for accumulators? Well, as we see in everything, there's a huge variance. There's no one fixed number. I've got five to 25% for accumulators and fixed income. I would probably on average go to the very low end of that, maybe five to 10, 12%. And that's sort of the rationale would be, maybe you put some of your money instead of cash into fixed income to get a slightly higher boost in return. But the low level is because it tends not to be a suitable asset for most accumulators. So if you've got a two or three year financial objective, buy a house, uh, something like that, then yes, it does make sense. But accumulators, for at least their investment portion, because they don't have a lot of money, tend to focus on the longer term, getting started on retirement. And because of that longer term time frame, they're better off handling higher volatility investments like equities. So it's probably not the best investment for an accumulator, but that doesn't mean it should be excluded completely. Again, if we're looking at shorter term objectives or obligations, it might be a good match, especially for shorter term bonds just to give you a little bit of a boost in return. And as we'll see shortly, and as we discussed as well in the diversification section, adding fixed income, even though it's a relatively lower return than equities, because of its current negative 0.35-ish asset correlation to equities, it provides excellent diversification benefits in an overall portfolio. So that's probably for an accumulator, the best reason to add fixed income to the portfolio, to give you some protection during those times when equities fall because of the negative correlation. When equities fall, you should see fixed income appreciate. Your focal point as far as investments go, well, if you're looking at the short term uh, objectives, then you want to keep high quality bonds and short term bonds to minimize the volatility. Basically, it's a cash cash equivalent substitute. If you're looking at it for diversification, maybe you look at a mixed term. So all the way up to 30 years, not long term, not short term but a good mix and that gives you some protection if the interest rate regime changes over time, you're not locked into one fixed term. You can also look at going slightly lower quality for that diversification. So instead of Government of Canada or Government of the United States bonds, you could look at state or provincial bonds. You could look at municipalities you could look at corporate. So there's a variety of lower quality bonds and because they're lower quality, they have to provide relatively higher returns on their interest income. You can also look at things like zero coupon, also known as strip or deep discount bonds. A zero coupon bond has its interest stripped out of it. So you're buying at the discounted present value of all those future cash flows that you're not getting. So you could be buying a thousand dollar bond for $15, depending on the time frame and the interest rate that's uh, embedded in it. You're not getting any periodic interest flows. 
So you're just buying it very cheap. And then when it matures at the thousand dollars, you get the principal back. And if you don't have much money up front, that could be an excellent way to start your tax deferred accounts is with some zero coupon bonds. If we look at consolidators, then we see that those are the people sort of in the middle of their career. Income is relatively high. Expenses are manageable. Consolidators have begun to accumulate wealth and their debts under control. This is the serious investing phase. For a fixed income component, maybe 10 to 30 percent. They have cash. So there's no need to substitute for cash or cash equivalents. They still have a long time horizon. If they're 40 or 50, probably won't need to draw on that money until 70. So that's still a 20 to 30 year period. So they can handle more risk and more volatility, which implies more equities. As they become older, the consolidators may move to the higher end of that 30% because they're looking to lock in some of their equity gains and give themselves some security for when they do, do uh, retire. Focus, like I said, as the objectives near shift from equities to fixed, and that may be buying a cottage at the lake, buying a second home in Scottsdale, Arizona, helping kids financially, not just retirement and still 20 years, you're going to have some medium term goal goals that are starting to mature as you get in your 40s and early 50s. So you might want to be shifting some of your equities, locking in the gains and move them into the more stable fixed income. Also in this era, you might want to look at riskier debt, high yield, sometimes known as junk bonds, foreign currency bonds. These sort of things, which again, provide a higher expected return because they carry more risk. And since you have the money and probably don't need the liquidity, you can take on some of the more riskier debt issues. It also might help as well with your diversification, uh, branching out into more than just government bonds. The spenders, they're the folks that are at or near retirement, we'll say 65-ish. They want to enjoy the life. Now, they don't have any more employment income in all likelihood, so they have to live off pensions and savings. The problem for them is in today's world, there's still a relatively long time horizon for a spender. If they're 65, okay, life expectancy might be 82, 84, but a lot of people are living into their 90s. So that could be 30, 35 years in which they don't have any employment income. So you just have to be aware of that. Hopefully they have accumulated wealth over the years. Many haven't accumulated as much as they'd hoped. And I think that's more a function that there hasn't been the focus until maybe the last 25, 30 years on saving for retirement. And so people that you know, are now in their 60s might not have got an early start on it like today, uh, where there's better education and better awareness of saving for your own retirement. The spenders, their costs are probably low. You know, no more driving to work in the morning, these sort of things, their house is paid off. But there's other factors that can bump those costs up. There might be health issues. They might want to travel 
because they're retired. Maybe they want to join the country club and start playing golf every day. So even though some of the costs are down, the reality is often that there's a substitute cost takes its place. Asset allocation. Many spenders invest 80 to 90% of their assets in cash, cash equivalents, and fixed income. Now, I think that's too high, but the asset allocation is obviously a function of many factors. And a big one is risk tolerance. I would say probably 30 to 40% in fixed ask income, and that's assuming maybe 10% in cash. So I would probably say just for the generic spender, you know, you still probably want 50% or so in equities, maybe even 60%. And then, you know, sort of as each year passes, you can adjust that allocation. So if you're at 60% equities at 65, maybe by the time you're 70, you're down to 55% and 75, you're down to 50%. So you sort of adapt as your life continues and you get more and more secure in your capital. Focal points, risk tolerance, obviously a huge one for many people. And you can't really, I'd say you can't legislate risk tolerance. You know, some people are going to want to take the chances and have those riskier equities. Other people, this is the only money we have. I want to be 100% in cash and secure bonds because I can't afford at my age with no more income to lose anything. And that's understandable. And there's really, it's not a good idea to push somebody into say 50% equities if they're not comfortable with that, because, you know, that's just a lot of sleepless nights. And I think that's part of investing is that you want to be comfortable. You don't want to be doing things that are too far outside your comfort zone. Again, people have different health, and living plans, that's your cost of living. If there is a history of health issues in your family, you might want to be planning for that and uh, realize that there's a good chance you may be paying that out. Maybe you want to travel the world. Maybe you want to spend your winters in someplace warm. Maybe you want to become a golf uh, expert. So a lot of things on a personal circumstances basis will impact your cost of living and your allocation to less risky assets and to create that cash flow. Inflation will also play a huge role. So if inflation is coming, then maybe you can't get by on, you know, two or 3% returns if inflation's pegged at 3%. You have to look at your real rate of return, not just your nominal. And again, we talked about the longevity of a life. That plays a huge factor. So while many people do go 80 to 90% in cash and fixed income, I would suggest it probably should be lower. But what that exact level is, we based on your risk tolerance, your plans, your wealth, all those good things. It's a quick look at some considerations for your fixed income asset allocation. We'll close with the third major asset group next time, and that would be equities. So thank you for listening today. Have yourself a good day.